Thank you for listening to this forum podcast. Please check out our website for a rich archive of podcasts and writing from contemporary philosophers and other researchers on a wide variety of topics. The Forum is an educational charity dedicated to bringing academic philosophy to a broader audience. Please consider donating to us via our Just Giving page, which you can find on our website. Happy listening. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Danielle Sands, and I'm a fellow at the Forum, and I'm going to be chairing this evening's event, in which we will be thinking about Shakespeare. In particular, why we're still reading, performing, and thinking about Shakespeare over 400 years after his death, and what philosophy might add to this conversation, ongoing conversation we'll have with, about Shakespeare. Um, so let me introduce our speakers for this evening. Uh, John Crace is a critic and writer, uh, famously for the Digested Read series at The Guardian. He's the author of the Incomplete Shakespeare series with Penguin. Uh, Dr. Jessica Chiba is teaching fellow in English at Royal Holloway University of London. She specializes in the relationship between Shakespeare and philosophy, conveniently for us. <laughs> and uh, Tim Crouch is an experimental theater maker, actor, and writer. His show, The Complete Deaths, features every onstage death of Shakespeare. <laughs> Perhaps that's a good place to start. Tim, why Shakespeare, why death? Oh. <clears throat> well, that particular project came about because I had been in conversation with the RSC about the possibility of making something for them. I directed a couple of uh, abridged productions of Shakespeare for young audiences, uh, and I'd also at the same time come into a relationship with a company called Spy Monkey, who are a, a clown company a kind of in the European tradition, sort of French tradition of clowning. Um, and we had racked our brains about what we should do, what we should offer anyway to the RSC. And it was coming up to 2016, which is the 400th anniversary of um, Shakespeare's death. And I think I got a bit tired at the prospect of another funny production of a Shakespeare play. Uh, there are loads of them, and to some degree they can be quite reductive. Uh, so I thought, well, if we're going to go reductive, let's really go reductive. <laughs> uh, and so offered up the notion, I think initially it was called Great Shakespearean Death Scenes. And then we thought, well, if we're going to do just some great ones, why, why don't we do all of them? Uh, to, to celebrate that. How, oh, how many are there? Seven, well, 75, although in, in that show there were 76 because the first death in that show was the audience's complacency. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had an, 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 usually as elderly as we could get uh, a lady sitting at the side of the stage with a, a buzzer and an LED display, and she was deaf and she had a scythe hanging over her. And whenever we hit a death, she would press a button and the buzzer would go and the number would go down from 75 to zero. Um, anyway, there were some, and then we also had another LED, this LED display that indicated what play we were in and which death we were doing. Some deaths we did very, very quickly. Uh, we did a whole medley of stabbings uh, in the <laughs> style of, of Bouteau. Um, uh, and then some deaths we lingered on quite because they deserved it. Uh, why deaths, though? Uh, I don't know. It's all human deaths. Well, no, the, there was the, the motif of the show was the fly from Titus Andronicus. Um, Marcus Andronicus chastises... Uh, no, well, kills a fly, and Titus chastises his brother for having done so. And I suggest that the fly was innocent and might have had a, a wife and a child, um, which in Titus Andronicus, where there's, <coughs> there's no sort of... Uh, that no one's backwards in slaughter. Uh, it's a beautiful moment. I think Shakespeare's small deaths are really kind of important. I thought about... Um, a Sin of the Poet was a key death in um, The Complete Deaths, and I actually took, wrote a solo piece about Sin of the Poet, um, who has, I think, 17 lines in total in Julius Caesar, and is killed at the end of Act 3, Scene 3. And I think without his death, Julius Caesar would be a very different play. He's a poor guy, he's a poet. I mean, we should explore why Shakespeare chose to make him a poet. poet. Uh, he, he's, his name is Sinner, which is the same name as one of the conspirators. He goes out into the streets on the day of Caesar's funeral, and is mistaken for Sinner the conspirator and is ripped to pieces by the mob. Um, and I think his ability, Shakespeare's ability to invert perspective in that way, to go from you know, high political rhetoric down to the small individual, the everyday, and how those enormous events affect the everyday, I think that's one of his geniuses. And often that's achieved through death. You know, I think deaths often bring people to a level, to a level place. 
Uh, and Shakespeare's characters talk about that exact thing, don't they? About death is the, the, the leavening, uh, the leveling uh, of, of human experience. Mm. So that's, that was one of the reasons. <laughs> but we had a great, yeah, that Fly was the last death of the 75. Um, and, and it was, I mean, the show was just over two hours long, so we couldn't dwell too, too, too lengthily on, on the deaths. And the mission was, I think, to, uh, yeah, to, uh, to remove any sort of um, sense of pomposity around Shakespeare uh, 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 and play it for laughs. If you're reducing all of the deaths in Shakespeare to two hours, how do you decide what to leave in and what to keep out? So, I, mean, I guess it's yes. a bigger conversation about how do we do this? How do we, how do we know how to adapt things for now? What, what, what things are the kind of essence of Shakespeare, if you like? And yeah. I mean, the thing with death, usually what's interesting is what leads up to it, and the death itself is quite inert and theatrically uninteresting. Um, but in the case of this particular show, we made the death as interesting as possible. We also drew analogies. So, for what example... What does that mean? Well, the, the, the assassination of Caesar, for example, we actually, in the whole of that play, we worked. there was a working through of, of, of contemporary styles of performance in a way so there was one, the straight man in that company an actor called Toby Park wanted to bring his company into a modern performance age and the other three idiots, clowns, wanted to do traditional Shakespeare so as well as doing 75 deaths we also explored a kind of dialogue between how one imagines Shakespeare was done, how it is done now and how the cutting edge wants to do Shakespeare. So yes the, the death of Caesar was actually uh, portrayed as the, the three clowns sacking the serious one. Uh, the stage manager bringing a box with all his possessions and asking him to leave the theatre and so the stage manager's name was Andy so it was Etu Andy um, <laughs> as, <laughs> as the straight man left and then once the straight man had left they proceeded to do a bubble show uh, so there was ideas around ent pure entertainment and, uh, and instruction. Uh, so there are lots of, th you know, you can un pick a loose thread in a Shakespeare play and, and themes just start pouring out of that space. And, and one of the themes for a contemporary theatre maker is wh where do you go with Shakespeare? How honourable should you be to the original intention? I mean, it's been happening at the Globe with, with what took place with Emma Rice, wanting to sort of bring new forms and formats to the work, and she was quickly ousted. Uh, so so w what is, a, you know, or going to the Royal Shakespeare Company, where is the tradition? How should we honour the tradition? Uh, and then there are other companies like Forced Entertainment who have done the complete works of Shakespeare on tabletops using inanimate objects. Uh, so I think he's there and he's so per pervasive and you can apply what, so many different approaches to him. So in the deaths, there was the working through of the deaths, but there was also a bigger debate really about how we present our stories. I mean, maybe that's a question you could pick up on, Jessica. And John, this question of how we honour the tradition, I mean, it seems to open into this whole... There seems to be lots of different ways of, of answering it. Perhaps, John, you could... Um, well, I mean, I think... Well, I mean, for me, one of the... Uh, when I was approaching the Shakespeare to write the kind of incomplete Shakespeare's, as, they, as I called them, um, was the notion of why 400 years on we still bother to, you know... Uh, go and see see his work performed, and I kind of think I thought for me the, the definition of a sort of classic really is something that still offers up and is relevant to audiences today and and, and lends itself to reinterpretation. Um, and you can play it straight, and you can play it um, in all kinds of different ways. And I mean that's very much what I wanted to do. Um, with, uh, I mean, my, I started off, I mean, it, it started off as a kind of fun, pro a spin-off from the Digested Read, which is a column I write in The Guardian and have done for over 15 years now, um, where you just take a book of the time, um, the day, and then sort of reduce it down to about 800 words. Um, a kind of parody, you kind of retell it in its own sense, um, but it's a way that you kind of play with text um, and it becomes both an entertainment and a kind of critique at the same time. Um, and I've done that with sort of classic works of literature as well. And I thought, well, why not Shakespeare as well? Um, and 
it just felt like, well, you know, why, why should, you know, is there anything sacred about it? And I kind of thought, no, I mean, I don't, I don't think Shakespeare would have been that sort of possessive about it, really. He would have been open for, for people doing it however they wanted. I mean, people do do it however they want. I mean, you go to... and as, No one plays Hamlet through at f- the full four and three-quarter hours these days because no one... You know, audiences just don't really have the attention span or the sort of physical stamina to sort of last that long. Um, so it, all, it usually gets knocked down to three hours. So there's a, it's, a, it's a long tradition of sort of cutting down Shakespeare. And, and, and again, I wanted it to be kind of fun. Um, I, I'm just going to, I mean, to give an idea of what it was like, and also I wanted to do it in the same, you know, to, for it to be like Shakespeare too. So I kind of did it in blank verse as well. Um, and I'm going to just make use of Tim now. We've got to act, have an actor. I mean, to get a feel. This is um, uh, the famous to be or not to be speech, sort of reimagined, really. Oh, it's just the sight unseen, just that Sight bit unseen, just the top bit. Uh, To be or not to be, that is the question, the very essence of philosophy. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep, to sleep perchance to dream, aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil. Or could it be that I o'erthink my life and take my torment far too personally? From too much thought doth little action come. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all. So man up, Hamlet. Get thyself stuck in. Remember this. I think, therefore, I am. Um, and that was, I mean, in a way, I mean, it's one of the, mo- it's one of the most iconic speeches. Um, and, you know, if you know the play, I mean, you can recognise that sort of some bits are just sort of Shakespeare. Um, I'm, you know, kind of thought, why not? And other bits are me. And, you, and to decide how to do it, I mean, this is where kind of, I mean, Jessica, kind of, I mean, because I was thinking how to do it. And I wrote this book in collaboration with uh, Professor Sir John Sutherland, who's a great English literature critic. Um, and he gave me a lot of kind of help and guidance. And I said, how do I approach this speech? And um, he said, we've got to remember that uh, Hamlet is a philosophy undergraduate. <laughs> and then suddenly it made sense because actually to be or not to be is really third rate undergraduate philosophy, isn't it? It's kind of the first thing. You can imagine sort of Hamlet sitting around sort of Wittenberg with a couple of other sort of students in a night. Yeah, to be. Yeah, or not to be. You know, that kind of sort of deep, sort of rather drunk, perhaps stone chat chat. And um, so then it suddenly became, uh, you know, it's also, I mean, we get mesmerised it because it's such great poetry at the same time. But the notion is it's sort of, it's sort of undergraduate philosophy. So that's why I kind of brought it back to sort of overthinking his life and to round to that, you know, I think, therefore I am which, again, is sort of undergraduate philosophy. It is the kind of back-to-Descartes, if you like. So it was to kind of contextualise it and to both be a text and to comment on the text at the same time. Jessica, do you want to defend Hamlet? I, I actually, I would like to defend to be or not to be as being a little bit more than undergraduate philosophy, okay. precisely because my specialism is uh, ontology, which is the, ex- the, the notion of existence in Shakespeare. And I do think that Hamlet's line is interesting precisely because of this thing we've been talking about of relevance. And yes, it is sort of cheap, maybe, if you think about it in one interpretation, mm. and I think it's completely valid. But the fact is that that line has struck a lot of people for a very long time. And when we talk about the relevance of Shakespeare, I think what we need to realize is that he is already relevant. So we're not really making him relevant. And there are these lines, such as to be or not to be, that just stick out to people. And it's possibly the most famous line of English literature ever, isn't it? I think it's uh, hardly an exaggeration to say that everyone knows that line. 
So these are the moments to me which I, I think sort of bring Shakespeare into relevance that, that still resound with us and are precisely the reasons why we are still studying him 400 years later, putting on productions, because there are these moments that just defy complete understanding. It's perfect. You, you, what you've done is also a, a great way of looking at it. But then it's not exhausted, is it? No. That's the point. So is that the genius of Shakespeare, that he is inexhaustible, that his works are inexhaustible? I can't speak for the future, but certainly it hasn't <laughs> been exhausted yet. So I, I suppose that the, the way that he has continued to be relevant, <laughs> that he lightens up something about our existence still, is I think one of the reasons that I find Shakespeare so fascinating. It, uh, in, in reference to why we still, uh, yeah, why, why he's still so important, I think... Uh, I will cite that wonderful Harold Bloom book, which is Shakespeare, The Invention of the Human. And I think there is an understanding. I share that understanding uh, that, um, that Shakespeare, to some degree, invented human character, really, or a, a language around human character uh, that was secular character, not divine character. Uh, and so m much of the, the, the inception of an understanding of, of human agency outside the divine can be found in his work. And so I feel like the characters that he created in that forment are, are <coughs> archetypes that still speak very directly to, to how we live now. Um, uh, the, I think about Malvolio. He's a particularly close affili affiliation that I have to Malvolio because I tour a lot with a solo Malvolio piece. Uh, and I think about what kind of a character that man is, even though ostensibly he's a godly character. I don't think his actions in that play are driven by God. Um, and he's a prude. He's a pleasure-hating, self-satisfied, smug, pompous bigot. Uh, and he gives us an understanding of those kind of those types of people that exist and will exist in perpetuity throughout humanity, I think. They are human characters, uh, and they are not special. They are, they are rooted into the ground. And so my feeling in the work that I've done in these solo pieces is to try and find the archetypal connection with those characters, because I think they are as important in our understanding of ourselves as human beings as maybe biblical figures, you know, uh, might have been in the past. Uh, we use them as um, yardsticks by which to judge our behavior. And even if we don't do it consciously, I think those characters are still hardwired into our culture, into an understanding of ourselves. That's why I make a lot of work for young people, because I want the young people not necessarily to understand the four and three quarter hour uh, Hamlet, <laughs> uh, but to understand the archetypes that exist in that work and how they still connect to how we perceive ourselves now. Yeah, I mean, I would. I mean, one of the things that struck me when I was doing uh, my uh, version of Macbeth was how, in fact, Shakespeare identified things long before we later put a name on them. Um, I was thinking, in terms, we have sort of Lady Macbeth saying, "I would have killed Duncan had he not resembled my father." Um, that is pure Freudianism basically, isn't it? I mean, it, it is... Um, That's what Bloom says, isn't it? They're all of Freud is in Yeah, Shakespeare. absolutely. Um, but he didn't have a name for it, but he could identify it. And also we get right at the end when Macbeth's tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow speech. That is sort of pure 1940s French existentialism. You know, yeah, everything's a bit... Everything's pointless, basically. Um... And, you know, I feel like Jess might want to step in here and, and say that maybe existentialism is a bit more than that. <laughs> uh, I don't know. French existentialism has never appealed to me greatly, but uh, the, the roots yeah. of it have. And, but you're right. I think I, what you're saying really resounds with me because what I've always been arguing is that Shakespeare maybe didn't necessarily invent the human point because it's a very polemical thing to say, yeah. but he certainly does provide a lot of... Uh, the, possibly one of the first articulations of a lot of the problems that became central to especially Western philosophy. So what I do generally is to read Shakespeare through later philosophy that came to articulate the ideas that he already had in his works that are embedded in his works, but again are kind of inexhaustible even with the philosophy that I use. But yes, Macbeth, I think, has the same kind of value as the to be or not to be speech. Again, it's one of those wonderful speeches just... It's not quite 
just everything is meaningless because it resounds and in itself has meaning while saying it's meaningless, which is profound, yeah, I think. Well, yeah, but that, I mean, that is the sort of nature of sort of the existential point of view, isn't it? To, to say everything is pointless is a sort of statement, statement. of being. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, I suppose. I think it, it's as much affected by the death of Lear, really, I think, that seemed to be the... Well, the death of Lear felt like the, the end of religion to some degree. Uh, and for 160 years after, they never played the play with the Shakespeare ending because they couldn't uh, countenance it, that such a thing that happened, that would Cordelia would be hanged and that the, the Lear would die. Uh, and there's, I don't know where philosophically that sits, if that's a nihilistic uh, perspective, um, but I, I can imagine how profoundly earth-shaking it was then and how the ripples from that reverberated for centuries after. Mm, Of course, I don't know whether it was fully grasped in the meaning that we take it to be today, but there is something nihilistic about Mm. the end of Lear. And perhaps the, the, the way that I've always read Lear is that in fact, the, the very nihilism of the play encourages us to understand that, that meaning is within human control. Yes. Because what happens is the, the breakdown of all the meanings that exist within the play prior to that point. And then when everything breaks apart, you realize that everything was a human construct to begin with. And the problem was with the type of human construct that Lear ruled over to begin with, perhaps. Yeah, there's another classic archetype, the, the father. <laughs> the, you know, Lear as that archetype is, I think, something that we would all identify or understand with. I did a production of, um, did a production of King Lear for the RSC for Young People uh, in 2012, maybe, and uh, reduced it down to an hour and a half and set it at Christmas time. So it began on Christmas Day when Lear gives out his presents Mm. and it ended with the 12 chimes of midnight on New Year's Eve. And it felt like a really, well, I mean, you know, he's inexhaustible Shakespeare, so Mm. you can flex and bend and fit him to many things. But that felt like a particularly appropriate, rather than changing the story, I felt like I was strengthening the flavours in that story in a way. Christmas is a time when a family come together. Mm. That's usually a time when people, uh, you know, uh, are quite short tempered with each other um, and everyone <laughs> resents the presence of elderly parents. <laughs> it's a generalisation but I've, you knew my Christmas then, uh, my family. Uh, so it felt like a, yeah, It's so, working for me. Yeah, good. <laughs> Thanks John. Uh, yes, yeah, so to try and find, for me it was trying to again exercise that idea of an archetype of where we would find it. Uh, I know there is a prehistory setting for King Lear which uh, again I'm talking about working for young audiences uh, I think sometimes that's quite a hard one to, uh, to, to grasp for a young audience. So I often find, n- not, not to simplify, but to try and strengthen an, the immediacy of, of, of the characters that we might know uh, and place them in a recognisable setting. Mm-hmm. Is the suggestion that you're making that human nature doesn't really change and that's why Shakespeare continues to speak to us? Yeah, I, I... yeah, um, and also he kind of identified. But I mean, it's not just he did that, but I think it's also in the language he uses as well. I mean, some of it is. I mean, you've identified with to be or not to be. I mean, I still would argue that it's basic philosophy, but it does ring with us because it is sort of poetry. And he knew how. To, I mean, he was a, just a brilliant writer. I think. I mean, one of the, again, sort of rewriting bits of it, I came across tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, and I kind of went through that. And we all know that blank verse is supposed to be ten syllables, but that line is eleven. And I kind of puzzled over it. Why was it eleven? And I kind of thought, he just recognised a killer line when he saw it, and he just thought, I don't need to be kind of beholden to my own kind of sort of framework. I can sort of bust out of it when I want to. I think he busts out with conscious sort of decisions, actually. Mm. And and what's astonishing about Shakespeare is if you study him in performance or if you study him in rehearsal, is that not only does he write brilliantly, but he also, I think, presents the structure in which his words should be spoken, uh, how they are laid out, the space that he gives them, how the rhythms and the meters are broken or the different endings that he gives to those lines. I think they're very clear directions to theatre makers, really, to how the the lines should be delivered. I think so, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow gives that sense of an unendingness and yeah. therefore that extra syllable gives it that, that 
length that it requires, I think. So it's, it is a killer line, you're right. But yeah. it's also, there's a lot of conscious decision-making going on. But to come back to your question about the, the universality of, of human nature, I would disagree with that, that there is a, a sense of universal human nature, mainly because I think that it does apply particularly to his age as well, Shakespeare's works. We tend to think of the bits that are relevant to all ages or, or at least to our age now. But there are plenty of things that don't resound as well, which get cut and, you know... If you have your four-hour production of Hamlet, there are bits that are going to lose the audience, and not just because we don't have the attention span, but because there are things that are just not relevant right now. So I would say that so far it has been relevant. That's my way of looking at it, and that there are certainly things that make more sense when you look at it through the lens of Shakespeare's own age. And then there are the things that that he anticipated from his age that became more relevant later. Now, again, I don't know what will happen in the future, but... I, I would hesitate against claiming some kind of universal human nature that Shakespeare has touched on, precisely because also I'm half Japanese and my feeling about the kind of global reception of Shakespeare is that there are certain things that do not resound with other cultures. Can you give us some examples? Oh, well, that's a very difficult one to give off the top of my head, but there are certain plays that definitely appeal more, for instance, to um, Japanese uh, theatre companies. And a curious fact, for instance, is that Julius Caesar is the most performed work of Shakespeare in Japanese theatre history of, of Shakespeare productions, which is not the case in Europe, for instance. So certain um, ideas about republicanism or about the, the way that power and authority work might have applied to, to Japan at the time that Shakespeare was introduced, perhaps. And something similar applies to a play like Macbeth, which has more values about war and about uh, taking power seem to apply more to the culture, at least the one that I know about. So, well, the, Perhaps the universality is around the openness that I find and treasure in Shakespeare and that there are, there are few solutions or no solutions given to any of the problems that he poses in his plays. So uh, language, I understand, yes. I think there are plays where the language has become relatively impossible. I was in a production of The Tempest, and there's a sequence between Sebastian and Antonio, and in the, I remember as an actor, in the Arden notes, I think it was something to the effect of, this is the most impenetrable, impenetrable <laughs> uh, sequence of Shakespeare's language in all of his plays. And then as an actor, I was, in t I was ex expected to to perform their meaning, their meaninglessness. Uh, so, yeah, there's, of course, with, 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 uh, as time passes, those, that, those language structures dissolve and disappear. But I think in terms of relationships, and I think in terms of the idea of character behind those, it's glib to say universal, of course. We, no one can predict the future. Or, but I, I think there is a, a recognition, a profound recognition, of how human beings... Interact, and I don't know if that's just Western human beings. That's He's a problem, Western yes. writer. Yes, I totally understand that. Um. But I think there is something to that universality, perhaps. I mean, the, the word is problematic in Shakespeare mm. scholarship now for very, very good reasons, precisely because the post-colonial implications, for mm. instance, the idea that our Western points of view might be applicable to all human beings of all ages at any time is a sort of dangerous idea for very good reasons. But... I think when you think about Shakespeare and the way that we look at human relationships or even the, the suggestions he makes or what his characters don't do are just as interesting as what his characters do. That is, what went wrong in the tragedies, for instance? Mm. Why is it that these characters couldn't work out? Well, perhaps that society is not functioning perhaps there is a possibility of a better future. Those are the sorts of things that I think have a bit more of a universal significance than, than the particulars of a play. Well, the complexity with comedy as well is that mm. I think comedy more than anything is time-specific or, you know, uh, or uh, yes, um, I think what we find funny now, we didn't find funny 10 years ago. And so if you apply that to 400 years, then you're going to be encountering some difficulties, I think. But both you and John have stressed the kind of comedic elements of your own work with Shakespeare and how important that has been. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, comedy is sort of my, my, my stock in trade, as it were. I don't sort of... I mean, it's what I do for a living, really. Um, you know, in my parliamentary sketches, in the digested read. Um, and so it's what I naturally brought to this. But oddly, when I was doing the... Uh, I, in The Incomplete Shakespeare, I did do Much Ado About Nothing as well. Um, and I kind of thought, if 
if if what I was doing with the tragedies, I did uh, I did Macbeth, uh, Romeo and Juliet, and uh, Hamlet, was to bring a kind of emphasise the comedic in the tragedies. Then perhaps the fun, well, the playfulness, would be emphasising the tragic in the comedies. Um, and so I kind of played. Um, I, I, I began to see ben, Benedict and Beatrice. Um, I, tried to, I tried to imagine them as a sort of pair of commitment phobes, basically. Um, you know, of people who were sort of unable to relate to one another, um, or indeed to anyone, really. And the idea that they're actually sort of quite old, that they're, they're in. They love the idea of love, as it were, but there's this kind of narcissistic quality of it. So whenever they're saying, so when they eventually do admit to being in love, there's a sense that they're only doing it so they can hear back the other person saying, I love you. And again, you're sort of let, that, that kind of leaves you with the kind of tragedy when, at the end when you've got this supposedly happy ending with Claudia and Hero married, Beatrice and Benedict married. And I kind of was left thinking, well, how long do these marriages last? I give Claudia and Hero about six months, and Beatrice and Benedict about a year, I think, because they're slightly more entertaining. Um, but unless there's any, you know, going to be any kind of change in their relationships, then it's just not going to last. And that, in a way, then colours the way you go back and sort of review the whole play for me. Yeah, I don't know. Comedy is a good vehicle for an idea. I think it, it can be, you know. I think you can put an idea uh, and loosen it and... What is it? It's like, I don't know. Um, it's the... It's the, it's the thing that gets the drug into you quicker perhaps <laughs> you know if you laugh then there's an understanding there's a more immediate understanding um i've made a couple of fairly serious pieces you know uh that are not just about comedy my banquo is a banquo solo uh which is just banquo i, I played Macbeth once uh, as an actor and was struck very much by how he can kill a king and he's okay but when he kills his best friend he starts to go to pieces. And Duncan's ghost doesn't appear, it's Banquo's ghost that appears. And so the, the, I, Banquo, which is the name of the solo Banquo that I used to do, I've forgotten it all now, <laughs> begins with this very simple address to an audience, which I'm going to read. Uh, I haven't done this for a long time, but it begins like this. It just goes, um, uh, just imagine anyway. Just imagine, even if it isn't true, not tr really true that we are, and how could it be, seeing as we haven't just met, but just imagine that we're friends. You and me, we're friends. This is to the audience. Imagine that we go back a long way. You've known me for a long time. We've seen each other through lots of things. And by lots of things, I mean a lot. More than most other friends, in fact. We were friends when my son, Fleance, was born. We were friends when your child died so young, which is a slight leap. We were friends through campaigns, through victories and defeats. We were friend, friends standing back to back in battle, our swords sparking and smoking and carving through muscle and bone and gut and brain. Odd to think you must have saved my life on some occasions, and I yours. Odd to think that. So my, that solo is quite a straightforward, serious piece of storytelling in which there is an imaginative offer, which is I want you to imagine that you're my friend and imagine that you as my friend decide to kill your friend. <laughs> and it continues to the very end. The I just imagine, he says, just imagine, just imagine. And it's also predicated on the idea that there is a suggestion given to Macbeth. Uh, the witches give a suggestion. Uh, it's nothing more than that. <laughs> and he acts on it. And one of the, the, the themes in I, Banquo, is what if the witches had said to me, Banquo, if they'd said what they said to you, to me, to me and not to you. It sounds like the Chuckle Brothers. I don't mean that at all, but if it had been, if they'd said it to me, would I then, because at the beginning of the play, Banquo and Macbeth are pretty equal. Um, uh, and so a notion of a suggestion gets worked through in that play and, and how you respond to a suggestion and, or how you can choose not to respond to a suggestion. Uh, and that's just me standing very, very still on a strip of paper uh, with a bucket of blood in front of me. And in the course of the play, I become engored with that blood. Uh, there's a boy who sits at the side of the stage who's flaunts, who occasionally plays a guitar. Uh, and by the end of it, I'm drenched and the last sequence is he reaches into that bucket of blood and pulls out a severed head 
So I'm being, it's for kids from ages 12, 11, 12 plus. And, um, but there's a hook, obviously, in that, in the visual sense. Even though I virtually don't move the whole course of that play, other than to occasionally dip in and get bloody. Um, and then occasionally music plays. And a candle is lit and then a candle is blown out. But the key thing in that play is a request to an audience to put themselves in an imaginative state of friendship with the performer. Um, so, yeah, when I say it's always got to be funny... I don't think that's necessarily the case. Banquo was a real test in how much I could, how far I could go, using really investing in what Shakespeare invests in, which is the power of words. I think there's a big thing in my contemporary making and my writing that's not Shakespeare, overtly Shakespeare connected, which is about. A, uh, I try and make my work as dematerialized as possible. So I try not to rely upon sets and costumes and visuals and video and AV and smoke and stuff because I want to try and generate what Shakespeare used to generate in our heads. You know, piece out our imperfections with your thoughts. Think when we talk of horses that you see them planting their proud hooves on the receiving earth. I'm not going to show you horses, but you will see them. And I think, I, I think I've taken a lot from Shakespeare. I'm not in any way suggesting that I'm anywhere close to the same thing, but I take a lot in terms of formal uh, devotion to the ability for an audience to see things in their heads. Mm. Um, and so I think I try and test that as much as I can in the work that I do. Partly as a resistance to the, the, con the burgeoning capitalism of the contemporary stage, you know, where it seems that most shows are demonstrations of material wealth and, and visual realisation. And I think, uh, like Shakespeare, I'm excited about, if I say a word, what do you see? Mm. You brought up this issue of identification, which I think is important. Um, and it's the form, it reaches us as academics, is this idea of relatability um, that students often talk about um, now. I mean, is one of the strengths, is one of the reasons we're still reading Shakespeare, this sense of recognition and identification <laughs> and... Um, the, the ease with which one can sympathise or empathise with characters, with relationships that are depicted in Shakespeare's work. I've talked a lot. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Just, yeah. Um, well, certainly my students seem to think that identification is one of the things, but in, in some ways I think that Shakespeare is interesting precisely for the, the way that he gets you interested in characters you cannot identify with or he forces you into a perspective where you have to understand a character and their motivation. So I think particularly of Angelo in Measurable Measure, which is, uh, who is a very, very complicated character who just wants to have, a, with, have sex with a nun, which is particularly bad and uses a lot of uh, emotional manipulation and blackmailing essentially to do, the, do so or to try and do so. And yet this play is a comedy. And I think there is a moment in which you, you do have to... I suppose it's just still a form of relatability, but he, he uses language in such a way that he, you have to understand Angelo. So when he says, what's this, what's this? Is it her fault or mine? The, sinner, the, the, the tempter or the tempted, who sins most? And you do wonder for a moment. And he answers himself and he says, um, she doesn't tempt, it's, it's me who's tempted by her. And, and I suppose identification is one of the ways that we get into literature. But then identification isn't as simple as I feel close to this character. It's a matter of sometimes feeling uncomfortable that you understand a character as well. Maybe that's mm -hmm. one way of thinking about it. Do you have any ideas? Um... I mean, I haven't really got, no, not, not a, anything actually to add. I mean, for me, it's, you know, I'm, I don't approach it as, as a, either a practitioner or as an academic Shakespeare, I, I just as a sort of end user, if you like. Um, well, so how do you feel you identify with it then? Well, I mean, I mean it just, it's a, it's, for me, it does become a question of, that, am I emotionally engaged with what I'm reading or, or what I'm seeing? And, and that's the level of connection for me. Um, do you know, does it actually matter to me? Does it affect me? Can I, you know, is it, I mean, it, it, it also goes down to, I mean, often with, with kind of books as well, um, there is this sort of notion that, you know, like, you know, do you have to finish a book that you start reading? You know, um, there is... Yes, yes. You see, yeah. <laughs> Always. Well, see, I mean, see, I would say not, um, because uh, on a, if you're lucky, you're going to read 50 books a year, most people, a book a week. 
I think that's kind of pushing it, which means that over your life, you're only going to read, I mean, a very few number of books, and there are so many books. How do you choose what to, do, what to see, uh, what to you read? like the introduction to Harold Bloom's Western Canon. <laughs> There's another book I haven't read. <laughs> Um, but that's yeah, it. that's all it says. Is it <laughs> fantastic? Well, that's digested, it ticked it. Good. Um, it, no, go on, John. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, and you know, so therefore, you know, again, it's a question, you know, with a Shakespeare, you know, why do you keep coming back to it when there are so many plays out there? Why do you go back and still see the same play over and over again? You know, I must have seen sort of Macbeth five or six times um i'm sure you know you've got, you've you've obviously seen a great deal more so what is it that sort of sends you back to the same plays uh rather than exploring other it's a it's a, a yardstick against which we test our imaginative powers i think to some degree it's like an objective material that exists and sometimes that does my head in that directors go oh i'm going to direct Macbeth. i've got to now demonstrate my creative genius around this and sometimes i just want them to just shut up and let's hear the play you know and i don't need the space age setting or the you know the, the extraordinary devices that are employed to use it cuz then i i i i lose the thing I loved in the first place, which most often, sadly, is reading. Uh, I, I, I try. I mean, I, I can't remember when I last saw King Lear. I did direct production, The Young for Young People, like I said, but uh, I have such a good production in my head. And I'm not saying the one that I made was anywhere near as good as the one in my head, uh, that I kind of don't... I worry about going to see it uh, because it will never live up to the one that I imagine when I read it. Who was that person wrote a poem about... Somebody wrote a poem about sitting down to read King Lear. Oh, who was that? That's um, Keats. Yeah, Keats. Uh, sitting down to read King Lear is an extraordinary thing, and sometimes going to watch a production of King Lear can be the most depressing, soul-destroying, uh, infuriating That's theatrical I experience. I well, actually, are we allowed to read Shakespeare? I mean, I feel a bit guilty because I, I was an English literature student. I've, I've done more reading of Shakespeare than I have watching of Shakespeare, but, but, but I feel like that's a bit wrong. But of course we need to read Shakespeare. If we never read Shakespeare, how would we ever perform it? We're always readers before we're performers, aren't we? Yes. And, and actually, what Tim says, uh, uh, even though I'm not a director, I have a perfect production of King Lear <laughs> as well. And so I, I go and see plays still, but I think you're right that there is always a sense of disappointment when they cut that line you really like yeah. and when they perform it a certain way. But then there's sometimes new discoveries as well. I went to a, a production of Macbeth where, where there was that line, um, he hath no children, mm -hmm. yeah. um, where essentially, um, and that's Macduff, isn't yes. it? Yes, Macduff says he hath no children in relation to um, he's told that he can have his revenge on Macbeth by killing Macbeth but this line had never struck me before that, that point, that produ production I went to see and it struck me because the actor performed it with such anguish and I realised that that line was all about how because Macbeth has no children he will never feel the same anguish that Macduff is feeling at that moment and sometimes you discover new things about the play when you go and see it so it's both ways for me. Uh, but watching is just a different species of reading. We should think of them as being complementary rather than... Yes, I, I think that I often regard performances as a, a form of criticism. A, a sort of, well, literary critics like me, we read plays and we write about them and we look at interpretations. A performance is another interpretation, isn't it? <laughs> The thing I have a big problem with yes. is, um, is illustrated Shakespeare's. Oh, my God, I, they make me come out in hives, illustrated Shakespeare's, because I, there is no objective Hamlet. There, and, and so for someone to draw a picture of a Hamlet or a Macbeth or Ophelia or whatever uh, is just not theatre. That's not what the plays are about, because that, with, with those characters, they look like the, char the actor who, at that point in that production, commits to being that character. Uh, and then they disappear. There isn't an objective identity or visual identity uh, to those characters. So I, I, had, I struggled with my children <laughs> and illustrated Shakespeare's, because of course they're brilliant uh, tools to uh, opening up that world. But I think there's something profound about the theatre text, which is they don't have a material existence. Do you have a problem uh, with photographs of theatrical 
Uh, no, because they are kind of ar- they're ca- ar- archival, mm-hmm. I think. Uh, but, a, but an illustrated Shakespeare seems to imply that this... Uh, it's a bit like the Harry Potter. You know, when the American versions of Harry Potter showed Harry Potter in the book, it was like, that's completely wrong. That's completely wrong. He doesn't look anything like that. Maybe uh, he looks like Daniel Radcliffe. Yeah, well, now he does, <laughs> and that's a disaster. Yeah. Um, but in theatre, in theatre, that's the joy of it, is that they are light. They are not of the earth. They are not in solid matter. Uh, theatre characters, dramatic characters are in us and of us and look like every one of us uh, depending on whether we engage as a sort of the contract that exists in theatre where I agree that I, for this next two and a half hours I will not be me, I'll be someone else and any one of us can be Hamlet and anyone can look like Hamlet I love the fact with Shakespeare um, you know, he, he was postmodern in many respects in terms of, of allowing this well the cross-dressing, I know that there were no women in, in his company but I, I, I think now the idea of just playing so freely with men being women, I imagine, I don't know for sure, that there wouldn't have been too much of an effort made to make the women, the men look like women. There was just an acknowledgement that that was the case and that there's a freedom in that. Uh, I put into one side the sort of gender imbalance in the companies of the, at that time, uh, but there was a freedom that anything could be any, that anyone could be anything. Uh, and, I, and I get that when I read a play. Uh, I, 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 I'm allowed to imagine and embody those characters in my own way and I don't feel when I go and see a play that there is any kind of fixing process oh Macbeth will only ever look like Christopher Eccleston now because I have seen Christopher Eccleston play Macbeth or Rory Kinnear he looks like that um, surely you can have hundreds of different sorts of illustrated Shakespeare's too, by that account. It's still complex, because you then have to give your child lots of different illustrated <laughs> Shakespeare's and go, it could be any one of these. It could be any one of these. Or I would like to say it is none of these. It is, a, it is an infinite possibility I, I see of these. Your perspective especially comes from a pedagogical kind of child and Shakespeare. I, I work a lot with young people. Yes. I believe yeah, uh, there is something uh, unparalleled to the act of introducing young people to Shakespeare for me, who, who don't have that kind of jaded, well, I saw five productions of Matt Beth and this one is not as good as the one I saw in the, da, 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 or did that, or I did that, like, or your brilliant privileged access to He Hath No Children, mm. uh, you know, to, to play it in front of a young audience who have never, sometimes never been to the theatre and certainly might never have experienced Shakespeare before, that, that's, a, that's like a that's a high for me. That has been a kind of like a druggy high. Uh, Because you can't... The the plays either stand or fail, you know, because there's no... There's no comparison to be made. It has to work now. Mm. It can't work in relation to another, an image or a cultural understanding of what this is. It has to... It has to work in the moment. Mm -hmm. I also think, I mean, going back to reading, I mean, I think that sort of reading Shakespeare is something that we have retrospectively done to him if you like. I mean, because in his time, I mean, he would have been amazed at the idea of people actually reading his plays. I mean, his plays were sort of creations to be performed, and, uh, you know, that's how he made his living. But they were published in his time as well for reading um, in the quarto editions um, and very yep. pirated. So, yep. presumably, I think he would have understood they were read that Yeah, way. but, I mean, how many people could actually read... Uh, the general education in England was reasonable okay. at the time, okay. given that Shakespeare, who yeah. was the son of a glove maker, had such yeah. good literacy. But you're right, I understand that it is predominantly, and the, the court of editions that were published in his lifetime, unlike his poems, were not published by yeah. Shakespeare, as in they were, they were taken by publishers yeah. and, and published. So, yes, not to undermine your point, sorry. No, and there would have been an immediacy for an actor in, in his theatres, uh, because they wouldn't have the full text. Yeah. There wouldn't have been any of that stuff you have in rehearsal where you sit around a table and you analyse every line and they you analyse every relationship. They just learnt and stepped forward. They knew their cues and that was it. And I, yeah, I, if I had a time machine, that, that would be the time that I would go. I, I would love to experience that immediately. There are immediacy. companies that do it, don't they? Uh, um, are there? Yeah, with the yes. factory, I think there are some companies that, uh, yes, that everyone learns all the lines and they... They, they just do the Q script ones. And oh, really? In, in Canada, I think there oh, is really? a, especially. But yes, yeah, so it's in, it's an interesting uh, experiment, isn't yeah. it, to see. But I suppose that we can never go back to not knowing what the plays were. That's the thing now. Yes. So it will be impossible to perform it exactly how they would have perceived it at the time that, say, Hamlet first came mm. out or something like that. I, I, I try and... 
Yeah, oh, thinking about the connection to the work that I make, there's a play of mine called An Oak Tree, which has uh, two actors in it, and I'm one of them, and the second actor is different every time the play is performed, and they must not have seen or read the play when they walk on stage. And I guide them through it. I did it just on Friday in Rada, and I'm doing it again a couple of times. I made it in 2005, and it's been around for a long time. Uh, but there is something that I passionately believe in, in the immediacy of an actor being handed a script, uh, that's what happens in the notes. So do they read it? Yes, they're a mixture. Uh, at one point they have an earpiece and I feed a speech into their ear. For the first, They've never seen or read the play, so they hit the, the, the lines come into their ears and then they deliver the text to the audience. Uh, other times it's clipboards with the scenes on. Uh, they understand the story. There is a very particular narrative, but they won't have got that narrative until they're until the play has begun. And I never really made the connection of, of, of how passionately I would wish to have gone back in time to have seen those kind of performances mm. where the actors don't have this. There is this kind of sort of intellectualism around performance at the moment. You know, I think um, to, actors are encouraged to wear beards and stroke their chins and, uh, and, 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 you know, and talk intellectually about plays. And I, mm. I'm excited that Shakespeare was an actor, you know, mm. first and foremost. When I said about how in his text he kind of directed how his text will be, I think the actors will have trusted that and that's how they will have been directed, mm. sort of inside the play in themselves rather than by some uh, you know, Oxbridge-educated uh, director who thinks they have God's gift or God's direct connection to the play. <laughs> Sorry, I've let off there slightly <laughs> and let, let rip a little bit. But it's true that he, he, there would have been no director and as such... The text is the direction, isn't yes, it? And there yes. is something wonderful about that. There's been a lot of work done on, on that in Shakespeare scholarship, the way that often false cues are given, for instance, so that a character will try and interrupt, thinking that it's their line, but it's not, and the, the line goes on, and often the cue is repeated three or four times, and this other character is constantly trying to interrupt, but obviously they haven't rehearsed it at all. This is just how it naturally carries off in the, in the performance. And if you have the full text in front of you, then you're reading out what you already know is going to happen, so it's a, a slightly different dynamic to the kind of uh, I- incredible, almost... Um, impromptu sort of way that it would have been performed. Uh, and yet the language that those actors were given is some of the greatest language ever written, which is kind of the contradiction in that. Mm. He must have knocked it out pretty quickly because he wrote so many. Mm. Um, yeah. I, I mean, one question I, I would like I mean, to ask you is, I mean, one of the things that struck me about Much Ado is that unlike so many of the other plays, two-thirds of it is in just ordinary prose mm. um, is that is that because actually blank verse is much harder to write and he had to sort of knock it out really quickly uh, uh, no I mean no or, it, the, or, the play directs within the play yeah. you know so when it's blank prose it's because it's a different quality of language I think about the sin of the poet scene in Julius Caesar Julius Caesar is full of this incredible blank verse you know you think about Mark Antony's oratory at the funeral and then you go to Julius Caesar scene uh, to the sin of the poet scene and it's just uh, prose it's just prose and it's too simplistic to say, is it that right, Jessica, that it was, the, it was the, the lower classes who spoke in prose and the upper classes spoke in, in blank verse? Yes, it, it is um, often that way, but it's not always that no. way. And sometimes you can tell um, a char- how a character is speaking can often mm-hmm. be an indication of how they're um, being portrayed at that mm-hmm. moment. For instance, you can have a, a, a lower-ranking character speak in verse and you will get a sense of the nobility of their ideas because it's it's a it's a meta theatrical contrast. Yes. Characters are not aware that they're speaking in verse or at least mm. that's not the way that they're they're being played. So they must have some sort of there must be something that Shakespeare is portraying through that choice. And um I, I think that Shakespeare probably could have knocked out blank verse just yeah, as quickly probably, as yeah. Yeah. No, I mean for me it was really interesting because Claudia and Hero appear throughout in blank verse, mm-hmm. whereas Beatrice and Benedict Beatrice and Benedict are fundamentally, uh, mainly in prose, aren't they? Yeah, that's a character note, I'm sure, mm. you know, rather than laziness on the right. No, no, I'm, I'm, I know I'm, that was an exaggeration, yeah. but I'm, I'm, it, I'm sure every, 
every decision is conscious, uh, although I think somehow his subconscious must have powered through in much of his writing. Well, I, I, certainly with Beatrice and Benedict, it gives some, a sense of their freedom and the, the incredible verbosity, actually, of the way yeah. they're, they're uncontainable. Just like Falstaff, who almost always speaks in prose, he's so mm. uncontainable, mm. he's just always all over the place, just like his, sort of his yeah. body as well is described in that sort of way. So perhaps yeah. that's... And also, it kind of, I found it sort of lent itself to sort of quickness, a quick repertoire RT mm. prose, rather in a way that sort of verse doesn't really. Mm. Um, well, sometimes verse can, and often if verse interrupts itself, so mm. sometimes a, a character will finish off a line yeah. of verse, then it's even faster sometimes, yeah. isn't it? And sometimes the, the, the ten beats feet of the will, will be divided between five Seven. different yeah, speeches, no, so, yeah. so there's a very clear indication from the writer that don't, muck, don't hang around here. Mm. You know. Yes, yes, the speed changes. I'm aware that we have thus far excluded the audience. It might be a good time to take a few questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I wonder if I could ask uh, Dr. Chiba, uh, which uh, philosophers, or there's an assumption in the question, but which philosophers or philosophical traditions mm -hmm. do you think have most influenced Shakespeare the philosopher? Um, do you mean the way that he's been read? No. Are, can you identify within Shakespeare himself any particular philosophical tradition? So Plato, for example, or Aristotle, or uh, other philosophers that have actually shaped or influenced Shakespeare particularly? Th that is a curious question, actually. Um, there, there are many texts that have um, clearly influenced Shakespeare, but it seems that he didn't read many of them directly. For instance, it's not clear that he read Plato or Aristotle, but of course these ideas are around in his time, and he has imbibed them and sort of put them in his play, but they're not, they're not direct influences. Um, one thing we do know he did read was Montaigne, so Michel de Montaigne from, from France, writing just before Shakespeare's time, he appears to have read some of Montaigne's essays. So we know that. Um, in fact, one of the things I find most curious about Shakespeare is the way that he often doesn't have influences from the popular philosophy of his day. That's the, a remarkable thing about it, is that he's not constrained to the ideas that were prevalent or that other intellectuals of his time were, were mainly based around. Does that answer your question? Hello, thank you as well. It was, it was fantastic to hear you speak about that. Um, so I'm an English teacher myself, and I'm literally just teaching year seven at the moment, a brand new school that's opened. And I had the joy of teaching them Rome and Juliet uh, for, for a whole term after Christmas. And uh, they absolutely, absolutely loved it. And I, I, what you didn't really touch on was why are we still teaching it in schools every year to students? And obviously it's on the GCC syllabus. And we're thinking, you know, who, if you who would you ever replace it with? You know, saying, is it, we, why we teach it, is it still relevant? And if, is there someone we would ever replace Shakespeare with? I, I don't know. I don't think there is. But <laughs> I, I think the joy of your students speaks for itself in that instance. Um, I think you're the specialist on this, aren't you? Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, you definitely are. <laughs> <laughs> I envy you, you know, to introduce a group of 11-year-olds uh, to Romeo and Juliet. Uh, extraordinary. They might have an understanding or an idea of it before they hit it, and then they have to hit it. Uh, and I hope they, yeah, they rise from that experience, that encounter, uh, rather than sink. Uh, it, de it depends how it's taught, of course. Yeah. It is complex about do we teach uh, Shakespeare as literature or do we teach it as a live performance text. Yeah. There's lots to learn from studying Romeo and Juliet as a live performance text. I'm always astonished that in the beginning of that play, uh, the prologue tells us how the play is going to end, uh, which is just a fantastic s uh, snook to, uh, in the face to, uh, to those people who say suspense, don't, you know, spo spoiler alert it's the ultimate spoiler alert, isn't it uh, they're going to die guys, they're going to die, <laughs> and so to explore those kind of structures um, it, when you think about uh, uh, Romeo and Juliet, and how the play is divided, and we were talking in the green room just before we came on about how different the play would be in the modern age, because of course someone would have a phone and 
the message would have got through? <laughs> and how do you then find a modern interpretation that, that neuters the possibility of being able to communicate in the way that would have rendered that story very differently? Um, so much to think about and talk about. Yeah, I mean, in terms of Romeo and Juliet, I mean, one of the things that really kind of struck me as a sort of outsider to the, uh, to the text was the exploration of just sort of adolescent love, the, rem the reminder that Juliet is 13 and Romeo is 16. And it's often, because the, with the poetry, you can kind of get carried away with the kind of the purity of their love. But just at the beginning of the play, Romeo is infatuated with somebody else entirely. And he sees Juliet once in a, at a masked ball. Something. So he probably never sees her face but sort of is swept up with this kind of teenage love and ditches this other person just sort of... She never appears in the play at all, does she? But she also doesn't Rotten. care for him, no. so that's OK, really. Well, I think we're kind of, <laughs> but it's not about that. It's about him, isn't it? Yeah. It's about yeah. his relationship with her. And, you know, he, he was... For, you know, at the beginning, he's swooning with love for Rosalind. Oh, and he's getting teased. And then within seconds, he's, he's sort of full on with his other... You know, and they could sort of, within seconds, they're getting married... I mean, it's nonsense. <laughs> but, but if you've ever, you know, been yeah. in youthful love, you just understand how that could very... Yeah, no, out. absolutely. Mm. Uh, uh, well, to, to come back to your point about, uh, about Shakespeare and the relevance, of course, I am a Shakespeare scholar, and therefore I will say that it, it is relevant, and I hope that Shakespeare does continue to be taught in the curriculum. I think there are people who would disagree with me on this, but... Um, I think he is one of the greatest writers in the English language, whatever problems other people might have. And it might also be that they were taught badly themselves, so that they, they shouldn't think so. Um, and just even as a simple example of great writing, your point about the prologue, for instance, yeah. it, it is great writing, even if it's not the done thing these days. This idea that you can tell the, the audience a story and still be able to interest them. And actually, by telling them exactly what's going to happen, they, it opens up space for thinking about it. Because if you're shocked, yeah. you don't think. That's well, how it works. You know what, you just don't know how. Exactly, and you're gripped yes. by the how, which I think is often a much more interesting thing. It's a great Brechtian device, really, is to tell your audience what's going to happen and then understand that the how could alter, could change. You could change this. And I feel that with Romeo and Juliet, you know, something could... How would we change this? Mm. It's a classic. There's the, the, the Brazilian theatre maker, Augusto Boal, who made this uh, Theatre of the Oppressed and Forum Theatre where you would stop a piece of drama and the audience would then engage in how you could change the situation. Mm. And I think there's so many of Shakespeare's plays that would sort of benefit from an educational perspective mm. to stopping and opening and finding the questions and finding how one could do things differently now. Even the question with Rosaline, I think, is great writing in itself because you have this contrast between Romeo being in love with being in love, full mm -hmm. of all of this high-flown Petrarchan language, which is complete nonsense, and he's mocked rightly by his friends for it, and the way that it completely contrasts when, when he actually experiences the real thing with Juliet. I suppose there is also the practicalities of a three-hour performance that they do need to get married very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's particularly interesting that... Um, it's not just that Shakespeare is thought of as one of the greatest writers of the English language. In terms of what we teach in schools and at universities, he has a unique place, pretty much. Yeah. Do we think that's justified? I mean, Bloom, for example, says yes, that, that Shakespeare sets the standard. Shakespeare is the best. It's Bloom who says, is it not that, uh, what is it, Hamlet... Jesus and the Yahweh are the three great literary figures of the last 2,000 years. <laughs> it's never short of a little contentious uh, statement there. So, so obviously that's why he would uh, argue for but his were, continuing you were very relevance. You careful in what you said, Jessica. You said one of the greatest. Yes. But, but lots of the kind of language you've been using, all three of you, has been suggesting that he, there is something unique, there is something qualitatively different about Shakespeare's work? And... Well, I, because I am a Shakespeare scholar, I am a bit probably skewed on this, but then I, I do, the reason that I chose to became, become a, a Shakespeare specialist is because I do think there's something special about him. And I think this comes out most of all, and I think that there will be some early modern scholars who completely disagree with me on this, but I think there is something particularly unique about Shakespeare, which is the reason why he is famous and that other people in his age that were equally popular in his time are not popular now. 
it's, it's not just about how it's performed because you can try and do a number of Ben Johnson plays now mm. and try and make it as relevant as possible. And it's not just because he's not famous that people won't go and see it. It's because they don't find it as, as enlightening. It doesn't, as I was trying to explain earlier, there's a sense in which Shakespeare is still alive for us, that there are these moments in Shakespeare's plays that, that still resound in a really meaningful social way. And I think that that's not the case for many authors of his own time and people afterwards who've just fallen into obscurity in spite of their popularity of the time. So uh, maybe it is that the, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in that we educate people to like Shakespeare as well, but I think there is more to it than that. I, I'm just aware that I think Shakespeare is in us anyway, even if we haven't got a clue. I think, you know, not just the language that he invented all those words, you know, not those words, they're also in us and we don't know it. But I think about how we think about humanity is in us from the moment we're born to some degree because it's handed down from generation to generation. The complexities around language, I think about Chaucer and I think about when you get to, or Beowulf, you get to a place where the language, the original language becomes so impenetrable Mm -hmm. and who knows in a thousand years it might be the case that Shakespeare's language is lost to us or becomes too complex for us Mm -hmm. and then something else might take its place but uh, it's not I can't see it happening any anytime soon mm. should we take some more questions maybe we'll take a couple at once yeah uh, the great 19th century cultural critic William Hazlitt said that Shakespeare was as great a philosopher as he was a poet uh, and it seems to me that Shakespeare had to know ancient Greek Latin various European languages. He had to have visited Denmark. He had to have visited Italy. So he could not have been the grammar school boy from Stratford. And I think this is important because if we want to take a message from Shakespeare, one message from Shakespeare, it seems to me that it shouldn't be that you can be a genius without knowing very much. You can't be a genius without knowing very much. Shakespeare had to know a great deal of philosophy and have a, have a hothouse education as a young person in order to, in order to arrive at uh, the standard of writing that he achieved. And I think it's, it's appalling now that the philosophy that's in Shakespeare is continuously downplayed. And you can see that in the BBC adaptations, because if you look at the BBC adaptations, almost always the bits that they miss out are the most philosophical. I think we'll take another question at the same time. Because did, did you have a question? Or it's an observation? Uh, I think we'll take another question. I suppose this is directed to a Tim Crouch, as he's a playwright and a theatre maker. Um, is it being unfair to contemporary theater to, to describe it, to, 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 um, to see it in, in terms of paucity, in, ter- uh, in terms of the ideas? I mean, why is it that uh, so much of it appears to be parochial and, um, to use a cliche, kitchen sink? I mean, why is so little of it dealing with the big themes, the, sh- you know, the, the philosophical concepts that we find in Shakespeare. Thank you. Whoa. Yeah, good. You, I'm going to try and combine those two things in some alchemical way. Um, you know that notion about you have to have studied and studied and studied to be able to uh, represent those things? I, I'm not entirely convinced by that. Uh, I, I'm a terrible example of... of lazy haphazard reading uh, into you know academic reading and I think that's a good thing actually for my plays because I don't know too much I know just a bit or I know just enough so um, my plays are that they're not probably the thing that you're searching for but they are they are conceptual pieces of work they are they they, they explore the the form as much as the content uh, they explore the the the, the act the act of theater um, and I think they also reference quite a lot of philosophical texts, but they reference them in quite a dilettante sort of way, but that nobody who reads them or sees them would maybe recognize the dilettantism in them. Uh, So I touch on lots of things. There's a play of mine called The Author, which ends with the stage direction, which is The Death of the Author, uh, which is a title of of an essay, a particular essay. And I have read that essay. Uh, I understood a bit of it. I understood the bit that I needed to understand and then I 
and I worked what I understood into the play. I know a lot of academic playwrights who I think are a little bit stru- uh, stuck by the expanse and the depth of their knowledge. Um, and then to, to leap from expanded deep knowledge into writing fiction uh, is, a, is, a com- is a complex one. I, I, I'm having these ideas as I speak to some degree, but I do feel that I'm glad I don't know too much. But just because I don't know too much doesn't mean that actually I'm still able. There are some moments in my place that subconsciously there are things that have happened that I've written and I have absolutely no idea how I wrote them. Uh, there are names that I've given characters that I hadn't realised that then uh, have been pointed out as being of having uh, belonging to strange matrixes of ideas around the names on a small level. Um, so I don't know. I, 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 I am of the belief that Shakespeare was able to write these plays. I am not of the belief that un- unless you have studied these things and travelled to these places, you can't represent them. I, I, I completely agree with you. I think that actually um, having the having not got all of the ideas in his head allows him a lot of intellectual freedom and given his depictions of places like Denmark and Italy are not at all accurate to the historical time that he's in and I think also saying that Shakespeare needed to have an incredible education underplays the amount of education he did have which in England at the time a grammar school education would have been pretty strong in all sorts of things like um, Greek and Latin plays and and rhetoric and all sorts of things that he would have required to write his plays, but it doesn't require the kind of university education that, that was available in Shakespeare's time to have written the kinds of plays that he wrote. Yeah, I mean, I can't speak as an acad- uh, I mean, I can't speak as a sort of academic on a Shakespeare academic, but I do, as a writer, um, I often feel that I'm part of the process of writing as an exploration. Um, and you're trying to find out what you're writing about in a way and what you actually want to say and it's a kind of process and the idea that you've got this sort of fixed point that you're heading towards um, when you start out on something um, is sort of alien to me really I don't know. I, I think the world is different now, I, obviously, uh, to 400 years ago in terms of what art role is uh, in the world, in terms of where are those big, where are these Shakespearean equivalents. And there are some writers who write big plays that try and uh, cover many, uh, range across many subjects and themes. Uh, they're not my cup of tea, those plays. Uh, I think there's an act of, well, that's a generalisation again, but I, I, I don't, personally as an audience, that's not the kind of play I want to see written now. I think there's something else that needs to be addressed, which is about how, well, you know, crassly, the, na- where, where the narratives are different now. Um, and there isn't an easy, not easy sense, but there isn't the same sense of cohesion uh, in society in a way. I mean, Shakespeare... Shakespeare's got a very clearly striated society uh, and, is, and is writing within a very particular sort of structure. Uh, that structure now has blown, I think, completely uh, in, in, in terms of how we, how we operate. So I am excited in theatre that maybe represents the blownness of it rather than supports the sort of integrity of it. Yeah, I mean, and also, I mean, I think in Shakespeare's time it was still just about possible for one person to know everything that there was to know in the world at that time, you know, which, you know, you could know everything about sort of algebra and philosophy, etc. I mean, nowadays, that's completely exploded. We just know how little we know now. I mean, nobody would, you know, you can't even begin to sort of do quantum physics and all the rest of it, do you know what I mean? Um, so I, I kind of feel that... You know, it's not surprising that theatre has become sort of more atavistic, really. Um, it seems like a natural progression to me. Mm. I think it's interesting that this question of authorship seems to pop up every couple of years. It was actually a couple of days ago that my Twitter feed was full of Mark Rylance again talking about Shakespeare and who he was and whether he could possibly have been a single person. I mean, why do we care? Should we care? I don't think so. I think it's a a reasonably convenient label to call him Shakespeare, but I also think there is plenty of biographical evidence to suggest that he was the glovemaker's son from Stratford. And I think that largely the reason that the authorship has been contested has been for classist reasons, that a lot of people felt that somebody from a 
a lower ranking background couldn't possibly have had the education and those sorts of things do contribute to that sense so that the, the people who raised these authorship questions to begin with were often upper class people who felt that, they, that it wasn't possible for anyone of a, what they thought was a, a in, inherently lower strata could possibly write something like this. And I, I think that there's no real grounds for believing that that it was written by anybody else, and I don't think that there are many scholars who, who would agree with the anti-Stratfordian stance. I think we've got time for a couple more questions. It's 10 to. I just uh, want to know, to what extent could Shev uh, Shakespeare's immediate world, you know, I'm talking about the... Uh, the the, the urban and the artistic milieu in which he operated. To what extent, you know, I'm also speaking about uh, the other writers who you might have interacted with, the likes of uh, Christopher Marlowe, George Peel, you know, G- George Wilkins. I mean, these are other writers who it's been accepted now might have contributed in some way to Shakespeare's plays. So, to what extent could that environment have also contributed to Shakespeare's philosophy, as we understand it? Right. Um, it, it's a question related to Shakespeare's politics. I've, um, I think a few years ago there were some... Uh, all the history plays were on, uh, on BBC. I watched those, and, uh, and I was fascinated by the fact that he, there seemed to be huge amounts of criticism of monarchy. And how did he manage to get away with that? <laughs> extremely violent times. And is it connected to the... Um, Plantagenet and the Wars of the Roses immediately preceding the Tudors. Thank you. Oh, these are two questions that actually match each other more than, than <laughs> might first appear. Um, the, the thing about Shakespeare and his ability to criticise the monarchy, let's put it that, let's go for that one first. It is remarkable, isn't it, to have, uh, to have King Lear performed in front of King James and have off off you lendings that the, that the monarchy is not an inherent thing in kingship to a king who believed in the divine right of kings. That's nothing short of cheeky. And I'm not sure that there is any real explanation of why it is that Shakespeare is not arrested for this when a lot of the other playwrights in his time are. But I think one of the things is that Shakespeare does rather politically, in, intelligently, place a lot of his plays outside of England. And that, I think, explains a lot of the reason why he has these settings like a sort of Italy, which looks more like London. And uh, the the monarchy question as well, you might be right that there's a, a sense in which it's in the past. And I don't think that he's necessarily following the Tudor narrative, but he does manage to get by with a lot of things by not touching on things that are too present or that are directly connected in bloodline to the people who are the sovereigns of his time. Um, to come to your question about the... The differences between him and the other writers and the the collaborations, well, there are some collaborations, yes, and I think a lot of things are being given a lot of credit for, that there are certain lines written by Middleton in this play or that there are little contributions here and there. Still, Shakespeare does seem to write more entire plays, um, even with a few lines, than a lot of the other writers of his time do. And I'm not sure about how that contributes to Shakespeare's philosophy per se, because I don't think that there is a unified sense of Shakespeare's philosophy in the way that we can talk about, say, Wittgenstein's philosophy or Locke's philosophy. But it might contribute to more of a sense of intersociality in his, uh, in his thinking. One of the interesting things about the philosophical outlook on Shakespeare is the way he doesn't have a unified theory. And that works perfectly well with having lots of different writers involved in it because precisely it recognizes this intersocial process, not just of writing but of living amongst other people in society. I hope that answers some questions. Yeah, what she said. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, I think... You get get a lot of psychology in Shakespeare, but that doesn't mean that Shakespeare must have read psychology. (laughs) All that comes from human observation and experience. So perhaps Freud read Lady Macbeth as he read Sophocles and got ideas about the Oedipal complex. Mm -hmm. If you look at uh, Hamlet, you know, there's a famous line, there's nothing good nor bad but thinking that makes it so. Mm -hmm. That founds the basis of cognitive therapy, but that's something you know people know intuitively. Doesn't mean he read cognitive therapy. Mm-hmm. You look at uh, Lady Percy in one of the Henry plays. 
gives a perfect description of post-traumatic stress disorder. That doesn't mean that Shakespeare read DSM-4 and the American classification system <laughs> and talked about post-traumatic stress. It came from human observation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I think of sort of uh, the Lady Macbeth sleepwalking scene where she's sort of obsessively kind of washing her hands. I mean, that is sort of OCD, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. And he must have observed it at some level and sort of incorporated into a play. He certainly um, didn't leap 350 years into the future and um, uh, sort of start reading an academic text on PTSD. Mm-hmm. And in fact, um, not, it, not just his plays, but the, the Rape of Lucrece is an excellent example of this, that it's largely a narrative told from the, the perspective of the defiled woman, and, and she ha- exhibits almost all of those symptoms of somebody in that situation that we recognize through cognitive psychology now, but obviously is not yet theorized. I think that's the key thing. And it's interesting you bring up Freud because Freud was significantly influenced by Shakespeare to form the Oedipus Complex. He's got a famous essay on Hamlet, which I think is is questionable, really, but it's still very interesting in the way that it developed his ideas and the way that he was inspired by fiction rather than from from actual real-life things. That's We call it the Oedipus Complex rather than a, a case study. It's interesting that... I have a question for the three of you just to finish. Uh, my Shakespeare knowledge is both a bit rusty and a bit sketchy. Um, if you could pick one thing that you would recommend that we all go and read or see tomorrow, perhaps something we haven't read or seen before, what would it be? Oh, <laughs> That's a really hard question. Yeah. I thought it would be easy. Uh, well, I, I think because it, how Shakespeare strikes you depends on what kind of person you are. So what you will enjoy depends on what sort of enjoyment you're seeking. So, of course, I can give you what (coughs) I like, but it might not be what you should go and read. Uh, Avoid illustrated Shakespeare. Uh, (laughs) Well, I think I'd I'd go for it. I mean, I remember when I was uh, um, uh, at school, I I, I loved Richard III because there were so many deaths in it, really. (laughs) And I was always, I mean, to take Tim's uh, point, one of the things that really upset me was that all the beheadings were off stage. (laughs) I kind of wanted a beheading on stage, really. So what we can take from that is that you should all go and watch Tim Crouch's (laughs) comedy. Yeah. (laughs) It's funny, uh, Henry VI Part II, his first play, has ten deaths in it, which is the same amount as Titus Andronicus. There's a little fact for everyone to go <laughs> and just contemplate. <laughs> yeah, he became more sophisticated in his killing as he, uh, uh, I think, as he went on. As all great murderers do. I'm they sure. do. Yeah. They do. So he's a psychopath. And <laughs> that's not something to take away from this. No. Uh, let's let's uh, emphasize the sense of the incredible humanity he shows. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Well, of course. <laughs> okay, uh, Jessica. So you're not going to give us some a tip to go and see or read tomorrow. Find your favourite actor and find a play that he's in. I suppose that's mm. a, or she, if you like. Uh, it's it's a. I think it is a really, very very subjective thing how how you introduce or introduce yourself to Shakespeare. But I think in most circumstances, everyone knows something of the plot and they'll have something that they they feel they should have watched years ago. So go and watch that one. That's it. There is a great uh, joy for me to go back to the invention of the human because he writes about every play in that book. And just if you go and see a production. Pick it up afterwards and just see what this old, what the old guy has to say, because it's been a great companion for me uh, over the years. That book, I recommend it. It's polemic, and I think you can't not be polemic. Really, I think you have to have a passionate position to adopt, which I, you know, I, I, uh, I appreciate. I think it's um, he, he's a broad church. He'll accept anything and everything. And if there wasn't a writer called Shakespeare, there was probably. Uh, the, what's that joke? Uh, if it wasn't Shakespeare, it was somebody called Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think on that note we shall finish. Um, thanks very much. Join me in thanking your speakers.